This episode of Spectre Sound Studios is brought to you by Fishman. Greetings, fellow guitar nerds. So far on this channel, we've looked at the metal quotient of various guitars, the Stratocaster, the Telecaster, the Les Paul, and even hollow body guitars. But we've yet to take a look at what happens when you introduce a new element into the standard plug a guitar into an amp method of playing the electric guitar. Let's take a look at one of the lesser used yet incredibly versatile tools in a guitar's arsenal for new sounds and how it works within the context of metal, the guitar synth. So what is a guitar synth? In its simplest terms, a synthesizer is a machine that electronically generates and modifies sounds with the use of a computer. So instead of an analog sound reproduction, you get a digital one modifying the sound from a guitar's pickups. What sets this apart from a flanger or a phaser pedal is that a guitar synth gives you access to a variety of different sounds, and in many cases, sounds that are drastically different from that of a traditional guitar. Think of it like playing a keyboard, only instead of keys, the interface is now your guitar. Not only will your synth allow your guitar to sound like other instruments, like a piano or a violin, but some synths can set many different sounds to musical scale, such as car horns or the sampled human voice. You fucking asshole! Now, before we go further, we need to discuss an important element of guitar synths, and that is the hexaphonic pickup. This pickup allows each string's outputs to be individuated, as opposed to the traditional pickup, which sends out all the strings as one signal. The six coil pickup system goes back to roughly 1935 with Regal guitars, but its output was only singular. By the 1950s, Chet Atkins was using a split coil guitar that sent different amp strings signals to different amps, such as the bass strings to one amp and treble to another. The door to experimentation opened, and by the late 1960s, there were prototype versions of hexaphonic pickups. By 1973, Bill Bartolini of Bartolini Pickups was producing them for the wider public. As far as synth units go, the first publicly available machine that started to resemble a synth is the EMS Synthy Highfly, released in 1973. This was developed in conjunction with David Gilmour from Pink Floyd and featured a number of effects such as distortion and a ring modulator. Because this synth seemed to walk a precarious line between synth and multi-effects unit, the Highfly has been called a hyper-effects box rather than a true guitar synth. The first properly available guitar synths came in 1977. Instead of simply processing the sound that came out of a guitar, new systems would control the actual pitch. This process is known as pitch to voltage conversion or PVC. This process turns an incoming note into a square wave and then analyzes how many square waves per second there were. The number of square waves is then converted into voltage, which controls oscillators. Perhaps the first unit to use PVC was the ARP Avatar. ARP were known for making keyboards and wanted to delve into the guitar market, noting there were many more guitarists than keyboardists. Not much has changed there. While the Avatar allowed guitarists to make some interesting and futuristic sounding synth effects on their guitar, the unit ended up bankrupting the company. The cost was a whopping $3,000 in 1977. That's roughly $12,885 in today's dollars. And it doesn't take a genius to see why it sold less than a thousand units. Those that bought one quickly came to learn the Avatar could not produce a true clean sound due to the imperfections of the pitch to voltage converters, whose technology was still in its infancy. In the same year, Roland launched their own guitar synth, the GR500, which would go on to be a modest success for the company. This unit came paired with a guitar built specifically by Ibanez, the GS500. This guitar featured a massive 24-way cable connecting the guitar and the synth unit. One of the famed features of the GR500 was the ability to have infinite sustain on your guitar. The GR would take the signals from the divided pickup and send them back up the strings so they could react to the magnet that takes the place of the neck pickup. Because of the varied sounds the GR offered, it became notable in progressive rock circles of the period, which were used by bands like Rush and Pat Metheny. Guitar synth soon entered a period of stagnation during the next couple of years. With a tepid response from guitarists and low levels of adoption, companies largely neglected their R&D on guitar synth technology. Writer Tom Mulhern also attributes this lull to the 1980-83 to recession in the US. 
Despite this downturn, the early 80s would see a game-changing development that would push synth technology from one that sounded like a fuzz tone Atari game into one that gave the guitar further capabilities to compete with the likes of a keyboard, MIDI. In 1983, the Musical Instrument Digital Interface was standardized, which is a communications protocol that allows musical instruments, interfaces, and electronics to connect with each other. The ability to emulate a massive number of sounds had finally arrived. It would take Roland two more years to release the guitar synth that would finally interface with MIDI, the GR700. The 700's architecture, though analog, was based on a JX 3P keyboard synth and allowed for six distinct voices, one for each string. The synth provided a MIDI output which would allow the guitar to control an external synth. In 1986, Judas Priest famously made use of the Roland GR700 on their synth-heavy and very divisive album, Turbo. The title track, Turbo Lover, features Glenn Tipton playing a Hamer A7 Phantom guitar synthesizer controller into the GR700. During the same period, the synth acts further pushed the technology. The system allowed you to trigger notes from six separate piano keys and would even set up a virtual capo on each string as well as save alternate tunings in memory. In the late 1980s, several other companies would attempt to launch into the guitar synth market, including Casio, Yamaha, Ibanez, and Korg, but all of their attempts quickly faded from memory and most sold poorly. Now, I can only assume that this was due to the tracking technology of the time. Pluck a note on the string and wait for the sound to emerge. This could take several seconds and really turned off a number of guitar players, myself included. Interestingly enough, the higher notes tracked faster, but the lower notes would take what seemed like ages. Needless to say, this was incredibly frustrating for guitar players of the late 80s when they were into playing fast. It's hard to play speed metal when you've got a latency of five to six seconds. Over the years, the technology has become cheaper, more powerful, and more portable. Though since never quite gained widespread popularity among guitar players, it does enjoy a niche market and has been noted as a powerful teaching and compositional tool. Many guitarists, such as Jennifer Batten, use them to enhance their capabilities in a live setting. Fast forwarding to 2020, the tracking and latency issues that have plagued the early examples are no longer a problem. Now you don't need a special built guitar and attaching a system like the Fishman Triple Play is a very simple operation. What's more is you don't even need a cable as it works via Bluetooth. Hook this onto your guitar, plug a USB key into your computer and you're in business. It's really that simple. Suddenly there's an almost endless amount of sounds at your fingertips. All right, so I've got the Triple Play hooked on this awesome Harley Benton guitar and I've got the Fishman software loaded into Reaper and I've got this really fun arpeggiator going. That's super cool. I don't know if I'd ever use that in a mix, but if I ever needed kind of a techno edge for a metal track, I'd probably go with something like that because it's kind of neat. Now, this isn't just about techno instruments. You can get sims of some actual strain classical stuff like this contrabass from East West, which is thrown in. Super cool. I absolutely love Contra Bass, and that's an actually pretty damn convincing sim. Now, one of my guilty pleasures as a teenager was the Judas Priest Turbo record. I played it to death when I was 16, and one of my dreams was to be able to play this lick on a guitar synth, and now it's finally possible. Now the mark of any great instrument is how well it works in a mix. And for, in this case, I wanna use the triple play on something maybe a little bit more modern. So I've got Eric Arco and Jackson Ward joining me on this. Let's hit it.
So can you play metal on a guitar synth? Well, I think it works really great for atmospheric pads and leads. Synths are not where metal gets its heavy rhythm sound from, but they're fantastic for adding in extra layers and setting a mood. Keyboard players and metal bands are pretty rare, and the good ones are in extremely high demand. So if you're in a band that's looking to broaden its horizons and find a more unique sound, you just might want to consider adding a guitar synth into the mix. You can check out the Fishman Triple Play by following the links below. Thanks for watching. See you guys next time.